Hey, I'm Saxon. I work for CCUA and I'm here with a new farm to school lesson for you. Today's video is called Celebrating Black Scientists Part 2. Today, we're going to introduce you to four black scientists who do amazing work. Two of them love protecting the environment and taking care of nature, and two of them are chefs. Did you know that a chef is a type of scientist? This series is all about representation, and we want to remind you that anyone can be a scientist, you and your friends can be scientists, and there are many different ways to be a scientist. First, you're going to meet Alex Troutman. He's a wildlife biologist. Here we go. Hey, my name is Alex Troutman. I am 30 years old and I am from Austell, Georgia. So my favorite marine animals are penguins. I really love penguins because they are kind of goofy and then they're dressed like they're wearing a tuxedo. Although they're dressed very formal, they still can have fun and be goofy. And uh, many of the species actually toboggan or a slide on the ice. And my favorite marine animal that I have worked with are Kemp's Ridley sea turtles. They are the smallest sea turtle species and one of the most critically endangered sea turtles. My favorite birds are crested caracaras, ospreys, even grosbeaks. The bird that actually caught my attention um, first were red-tailed hawks. I used to see them all the time when I was fishing with my um, dad and brothers and uncle. And I just love like just seeing the sunshine through their rare tail while they're um, soaring around. This field has given me opportunities that I never even imagined myself in. Like living in the middle of the ocean on a boat, protecting sea turtles or traveling across the globe to other countries to study bat diversity. I'm gonna keep it straight with y'all. This field, it'll change you. This field will have you doing things you never thought you would be doing. I was a shy, introverted kid. I was uncomfortable being the new person, the one who stood out in the crowd. But now I'm like, because of my positions, I have been in front of 300 people talking to them on stage. Many times I am that new person. And not only am I the new person, I'm the only black male Many times the only black individual pair in the room and also the youngest. So this field uh, will have you overcome childhood um, fears and insecurities. Be prepared to be changed by this field. Like 99% of the things that you want in life is just beyond your comfort zone. So you have to break through that. Man, some advice I'll give to the younger generation is be 100 with yourself. Um, be 100%. Uh, unapologetically you there are going to be people who um, who are hating or naysayers that try to persuade you to choose other careers but at the end of the day you could be making six figures or more and if you go in that day have that job every day resenting that job are you truly going to be happy no so pursue the field and interests that you're already passionate about. Another thing of advice that I will give y'all is go ahead and start getting um, experience, either volunteering or if you can um, work, go ahead and get start getting that experience with uh, like zoos or aquariums. And then lastly, soak up all the knowledge you can. Um, so just go ahead and get the experience, get the knowledge and be 100% you. One of the things that I'm most excited about is happening this year. I was awarded a early career fellowship with the Safana Center. With this fellowship, I will be able to give back to the younger generation. Um, kids who, like me, may not see themselves represented in the field that they wanna be in. So I'm most excited about this, um, just the opportunity to be that representation that I never had and to help kids find their passion for the outdoors and natural resources. My name is Annie Fisher. I was born in 1867 right here in Boone County, Missouri, the most famous chef 
to ever reside in Boone County. We didn't have much money, so as a child, after about the second grade, I had to go to work in the fields. But my salvation arrived when they asked me to come work in the house to rock the babies. So when I wasn't busy, I would hang out with the cooks in the kitchen. And that's where all the wonderful aromas and smells would be. And that's where I wanted to be. And they would allow me to experiment with all the herbs and spices and dough. Well, I got pretty good at it. At about 15 years old, I had a child. Her name was Lucille, and that didn't stop me. Miss Lenore encouraged me um, as I cooked for the family that maybe I could cook for some of her friends and their parties. And so that's how I started the catering business. I was one of the busiest cooks in this city. There wasn't a party or an event that happened here in Columbia that I, Annie Fisher, if it was of any status, didn't have something to do with. In fact, people would change the dates of their debutante balls or their wedding so that I, Annie, could accommodate them. This fine modern appliance called a graph, or better known as a beaten biscuit machine, this modern day appliance has just really revolutionized my biscuit making. <laughs> now I put the dough together, fold it, and put it through the rollers. And we do that repeatedly until blisters form. When blisters form on the dough, it's ready to cut. So we would use the biscuit cutter to cut on the dough and the nails would release a stack of dough. Oh, they describe my biscuits as creamy, fluffy, and flaky. Yes, <laughs> my world famous beaten biscuits. And I inherited some land out in the south part of town and built the Wayside Inn and Fair Oaks, the fine dining hall. And it had so many windows and so many of the Mizzou alumni would frequent. What's really uh, ironic is I owned the restaurant, but I couldn't serve my own people in the restaurant. They could work at Fair Oaks, but they would have to come to the kitchen door in the back to place their orders and pick up their food and leave. Something exciting happened in our state in 1904. Do you know what that was? Oh, it got world attention. The 1904 World's Fair. We pitched a tent and we went to sell our country hams and my famous beaten biscuits. We entered a recipe contest at the encouragement of many and we took first place. Do you realize that the proceeds from that 1904 World's Fair built our Supreme Court building across from the Capitol in Jefferson City. I like to think that I, Annie Fisher, made a contribution. I um, was the general contractor of one of the most fabulous homes on Park Street, 608 East Park. I was one of the most lucrative landlords in the in this city. I mean, the early 1900s, a single black woman owning 18 homes, mail ordering biscuits to Wall Street, owning more china, silver, and linens than anyone in Boone County, served presidents with a beaten biscuit recipe. How can I encourage you today? I did it in a time when it was unheard of. Not only was I a female, at the turn of the century as a businesswoman, but a black woman at that. I capitalized on the perceptions of others. See, it's not what you call me, it's what I answer to. I'm Ms. Annie Fisher. Find your niche, find your passion, perfect it, and let the world know how great you are. Thank you. Hey everybody, it's Mr. Clint here with CCUA. We are here in my kitchen today, one of my favorite places to spend time. Uh, and just the other day when I was in here, I made a big old pot of beans and greens. So you might be familiar with beans and greens, but if you're not, 
It is an example of Southern cuisine or Southern style cooking. Now, Southern cuisine has a rich, long, complex history, but we can think of one person that kind of took Southern cuisine and brought it to a national level. That person is Edna Lewis. Edna Lewis is a world-renowned chef, author, and teacher. Uh, she was most famous for a cookbook she wrote, but had a really long and interesting life. She was born in 1916 in Freetown, Virginia. Uh, she grew up gardening, cooking, sewing. Specifically, she learned how to cook the things that she was gardening around her. She eventually, like most people do, moved away from home. She lived in DC and then eventually New York City, where she held a lot of different jobs, uh, including some cooking, but when she wasn't working, she loved to throw these huge, lavish dinner parties. She would have all of her friends over and they would invite their friends over and she would feed everybody all these Southern inspired dishes. Uh, and there was one person in particular that was really into that food and he wanted to open a restaurant. So he talked to Edna Lewis, asked if she would be the head chef. She said yes, and the rest, as we say, is sort of history. They opened the Cafe Nicholson together, uh, and she was the head chef there for many years. Eventually, after a few other jobs, she actually had a really bad accident where she broke one of her legs and wasn't able to get around the kitchen to do the cooking that she loved so much. Uh, don't worry, she did heal and she did get back in the kitchen, but while her leg was broken and she was healing, she wrote what has now become one of the most popular cookbooks for Southern style cooking called The Taste of Country Cooking. It was one of the first cookbooks written by a black woman that became popular all across the country. You can find this book in, in bookstores and kitchens uh, in just about every state in the United States. Can you guess what I was trying to communicate to you? What I wanted to say was, hey, it's Saxon, and I'm walking down the Katy Trail. You may have taken a walk down the Katy Trail or the MKT in Columbia. Lots of people like to walk for fun. But our next scientist, John Francis, he's known as the planet walker because he made the choice to walk everywhere he went for 20 years. John Francis was born in 1946 in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. When he was 25, he was living in San Francisco, California. And at that time, there were these two big ships carrying oil. We use that oil and turn it into gasoline to power our cars. Those ships crashed into each other and spilt all that oil out all over the ocean, the fish and the birds that were living there. And John went out and he helped to clean the beaches and wash the birds. But when that was all over, he felt like he wanted to do more. So he decided that he was not going to ride in motorized vehicles. He walked everywhere he went like that for 20 years. John noticed that he was getting in lots of arguments with, with people that he knew because he had such strong beliefs. And so when he was 27, on his birthday, he decided to take a day of silence where he didn't speak at all. And when he was doing that, he noticed that it allowed him to listen and learn from the people he cared about. So he decided to do it for a few more days. And then he ended up taking a vow of silence that lasted for 17 years. So now John is walking everywhere that he goes and he's not speaking. And even though those are two pretty challenging things to do, he was able to do some amazing things with his life. He walked all over the United States, he walked and sailed to South America. He walked to three different schools and earned three different degrees. And he also taught other students while using symbols. At some point, John decided that he was going to start using vehicles again and he was going to start speaking because he felt like he could have a greater impact on more people. So he wrote legislation that helped regulate oil spills for the U.S. government. And he also became a U.N. ambassador for their environmental program. 
Today, he's a professor, an author, a speaker, and still an environmental activist. He plays the banjo. So John's big message to all of us from his life and learning is that because we humans are a part of the environment, the way that we treat each other is really important. And it affects how we treat the natural world around us. For more information on the black scientists featured in today's video, check out the resource link in the description below.